I say keep the hairdo. <laughs> no, sé, esto está mal aquí, pero bueno, okay. Anyhow. Hello let's everyone. Let's do it. Ooh. Welcome to the Frontline Club in 2019. Um, very happy to welcome Maria Jimena Duzan and Ed Vuliami, who some of you may know. I won't do the introductions, they'll do it themselves. Um, there will be a time for some Q&As afterwards. Please keep them short because Maria Jimena is actually on holiday. So <laughs> back to the holiday after <laughs> <I> this. <laughs> um, yeah, without further ado. Well, look, thank you all very much for coming. <coughs> and also thank you, Austin. This is the first time, the first of, I hope, many collaborations between our new events, producer, manager, whatever you are, person, um, and, and myself. So thanks a lot for all this. And indeed, you know, the, the idea was that Maria Jimena was planning to have a holiday in London, <laughs> staying here, fat chance. <laughs> um, Don't worry. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's particularly important to have you know when we do these things um to have a you know it just is special and different when you have a personal political um investment in it all this is for me much more than a than a, than a sort of professional journalistic engagement i've worked with maria jimena for a long time now and you know we say colombia's leading journalist which is one of the great journalists of the world by a long way and there's another matter that's crucial um which is that we're talking about a peace process. And you know, this institution <coughs> was supposed to be about combat journalism and war reporting, but as we all know, there are war reporters who quite like war. You know, at best, it gives them a sense of purpose. At worst, it gives them a thrill. And, um, and but I always think that sort of, you know, uh, war reporting should sort of aim at being peace reporting um, in the long run. Uh, the best thing about a war is when it ends. Um, and <coughs> that's what Maria Jimena has become, in a way, is a, is, a, is, is, a, is a reporter and a writer and an author and a journalist and a broadcaster who has covered the longest-running war in the world, and now its end. And that's, in a way, what's sort of, I hope, heartening about some of the things we'll be talking about and rather disheartening in others, because peace is tougher than war. War, you just devise better ways of killing people. But the ways of writing about it, peace is much harder to, to achieve and to cover. Marie Jimena, it's a, a great honour to have you. Thanks. Answer. Um Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> We've planned a sort of structure, but um, Marie Jimena's husband, Oscar, has a proper job. He's a jazz musician. Where we make people miserable for a living, he makes them happy. So we're going to, as long as we know what key we're in, then we'll take a leaf out of Oscar's <laughs> book, and it'll be a bit like jazz. We'll just sort of take it. But Marie came in, I think, um, now, most, if not many of you, will know the context of the peace process, but um, for people watching on a live stream, which Austin's very kindly got up and running, I think, let's, can we start by setting the peace in Colombia and the peace deal in the context of perhaps fairly briefly, as brief as, brief as, as, as we can, um, you know, of this, this thing that began in sort of 1948 and then got its latest wind in 1964. It's been fighting for a long time. Yeah, thanks for having me here in Frontline. I'm, I'm trying to see if this works with me because it works with you but it doesn't it, i don't know why you got more hair than i'm going to eat this microphone so <laughs> I yeah i don't i don't know what happens but i'm tr we'll try okay we'll do my best okay now it's working so yes you know uh, in colombia we had uh, this um I, I would say 45 or 60 years of war and in the end, uh, a war that we thought was never going to end, um, thanks to President Santos and the FARC, which is the oldest guerrilla, that I think is the last guerrilla in the world. The last guerrilla in the world was Las FARC. So uh, they decided to settle down and to, after five years, you know, f uh, going back and forth from La Habana, which, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the whole uh, setting was uh, 
there, you know, and the, and the Cubans were the ones who, who opened up the doors and decided for the, that it was very important to have all the dialogues and the uh, peace process over there. So after four years of coming back, back and forth, uh, we signed a peace treaty. And um, it, was, it was something that we Colombians didn't acknowledge at that time because it was, for us it was, it was very difficult to acknowledge peace, which is you know, the worst thing to happen Oh, that happens to a society that doesn't know what to do in peace. After many years of war, you just get used to the war. So now, we finished the war, the FARC were dismantled, they gave up the arms, they right now are in the Congress, see? They are submitting themselves under the new uh, tribunal, uh, judiciary tribunal that was created uh, within the agreement, and they're going to submit themselves on the, those, this tribunal, international tribunal. And uh, so, so all of a sudden, the Colombians were like this, you know, we didn't know what to do. And what happened was that after we signed the agreement, uh, one week after that important moment in Colombia, we decided to do a plebiscite. And guess what happened? we lost the plebiscite. Well, you know, Brexit, you know, we, we no Brexit. Well, we did have our Brexit as well. So in a way, it was very difficult to understand what has happened to us. Because we imagine after four years, we end a war of 550 years. And then all of a sudden, we go and vote, and uh, we lost the plebiscite for 5,100 uh, votes, but it was, you know. Very, very Brexit. Yeah, very Brexit, <laughs> very Brexit. And um, uh, what is important about the peace agreement is that it was not only a peace agreement for Las Farc to dismantle a guerrilla. That happened, and it did very well. Right now, as I said yeah, earlier, they are right, in the con right now in the Congress. They're members of the Congress. But what was important was all the reforms that uh, the, uh, the uh, peace agreement, you know, uh, was again, you know, putting the agenda uh, as the main thing that would have to do Colombia if a country wants to build the real peace. The rural reforms, we didn't have, you know, we are the only country in Latin America, and I would say, uh, in the world that didn't have a rural reform at all, at all, no rural reforms. So all the preservation, all the statu quo, uh, you know, it's very powerful in Colombia. They want to preserve everything, especially, you know, rural reforms. And, and especially, you know, <laughs> the, the world that uh, it's, or, or the, the, the country, the countryside and, and the feudal ways of, of seeing, you know, uh, is land what that war was fundamentally about for 60 years? At, at its yeah. Point. At, <coughs> at Ownership at the, of land, distribution of land. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, since we didn't have a rural reform, well, the, the fight for the land became, you know, the quest for all, you know, all, all this war, and, and the, the people were really fighting for the land, see? Because the distribution is what was not going well, and never went well, and so that was something that really was at the bottom of all this war. And that's why it's very important uh, not only to accomplish the, I mean, to understand that what we did was not only to sign a peace treaty, to dismantle the FARC, and, uh, but as well to open up the, the window for the rural reforms and the social reforms we have to, to do as a society that no longer faced a war. And that has been very difficult to understand by the Colombian elite, especially the politicians that want to preserve you know, the statu quo. And uh, still, uh, that's the question we are facing right now. You know, we have to endorse you know, that, th those sorts of, 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 of uh, ways of uh, um, really putting in place what really means, you know, the, the, the core of the, of the peace agreement, but still, you know, 
We don't know. Well, we'll get to the end. We'll <laughs> we set up our, our conclusions for sure. Because what what on earth now? Um, for people who you know do know and people who don't, um, th these three kind of players really <coughs> at stake. And we'll get to narco traffic later, and 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 the legacy of Escobar. But for the moment, Uribe and the paramilitary connection to politics. Um, Fuck. I mean, how do they do it? You say they're the, the last guerrilla, but how do they manage it into the 21st century in the way that they have? And then the figure of Santos. We, we, we're not going to go into um, confessional, personal stuff, but <coughs> uh, Maria Jimena's family, as I think most of you know, lost Maria Jimena's sister, Silvia, to the coverage of this. Uh, she was killed by the paramilitaries in one of the most infamously unsolved cases, and we can talk about impunity if you like, but perhaps that's a way to go into the, the figure of, uh, or perhaps I should say, Uribismo. Um, uh, those three, please just talk a bit about your take on those three kind of corners of this. Um, the Uribista movement, the, 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 the FARC, and, and, and as it were, their, their tenacity over time, despite their relatively small size, and this figure of Santos, um, and we'll get to the book later because this is uh, out six months now, um, and it's marvellous. But just those three, those three corners, if you like. Well, I would like to explain uh, who really is, I mean, uh, the, the character behind Alvaro Uribe, former president of Colombia. And it's very easy right now because we, we have lots of Uribes around the world. At that time, we didn't. You see, we were the first one. See, right now, I can explain it very well. I mean, actually, you have here Boris Johnson, see? You have uh, John Donald Trump, of course. Don that was before, there was Boris Johnson, and then you have Donald Trump. And now we have Bolsonaro. So, so we have, you know, so many uh, ways to explain, I mean, to, and, and to explain what happened when once you have populism, you know, the populism you know, are rising in your country. And, and we were the ones who, who had that sort of experiment, a political experiment, uh, uh, before the other ones, be the other countries, before the United States, uh, before Trump, before uh, Brexit, and uh, before, I mean, it was amazing for us, even for us to have the, this sort of leadership. So Uribe, it's like, you know, it's a mixture of of Trump, Bolsonaro, <laughs> and uh, in a way, yeah, well, maybe you, you don't think so, but you know, it's, it's, it's a very appealing, appealing, I will tell you something, a very appealing character, has a strong character and very appealing. So he has this way of uh, fi finding, you know, the core of the people, of the, the will of the people, and, uh, and I think, that's why he was so successful, you see? Because he was really, you know, uh, trying to, to, I mean, he interpreted, uh, he, he understood people, you see? The will of the people. And that's how populism really grows, you see? Santos was not like that. Santos was, you know, no appealing at all, no leadership, you know? If you would have Santos here, you wouldn't notice him. See, Juan Manuel Santos, the Nobel Prize. I'm talking about Nobel Prize. If you would have Uribe here, you would have Uribe, you know, everybody was queue up, you know, want to shake his hand because he's really appealing, you know. Santos is nobody. I mean, it doesn't have any appe appealing, uh, I mean, appeal at all. doesn't have any aura as well. So, so it's two ways of seeing politics. You see, two ways of seeing society. Uribe said that the best thing to do was to fight, and that the war was the, at the core of our strategy. See? And he did really well. He did fight Las Farc you know, and push him into uh, a corner where Santos you know, decided that it was enough for the war and that it was time to open up the window of a peace process. So it was quite different. Why did he do it? I mean, he had been Uribe's protege, after all, his Minister of Defense during the The best Uribista was Santos. Um, <coughs> yeah, Santos was 
the number one Uri Vista, you see. And uh, I remember when, when we saw all of a sudden so many changes when he arrived to power. And uh, I remember I, I told him once, he said, if I had known that you were going to do what you did, uh, I, I might have voted for, for you. I didn't vote for Santos. And uh, I didn't like uh, uh, the way Ul the Ulivismo uh, was leading the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, that many Colombians think like me. And, but I respect the Colombians that think that that was the right uh, way to go or the, that was the right leadership that the country need. Uh, what happened was very strange because Santos decided to change everything. Being and uh, he used Uribe to climb the ladder because he didn't have any appeal and um, became the president and one, once he became president he decided to really sh uh, shut down all the you know shut down all the all the relationship with with, with, to cut down all the relations with, with Uribe. The motivations are fascinating because, and, I mean, you, we, 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 we're, we're working on a film about this and you asked San President Santos for the film, we hope to finish, anyone with a lot of money watching the live food who wants to help us, please. But you asked him, you know, why did you do it? And he said, he said I, I was told that I would expend my political capital by doing this. And I said, I'd rather do that than miss the opportunity. And, and, but yeah. have had the chance and not the, taken it. The interesting thing I mean, about not many politicians think like that. Yeah, but the interesting um, about yeah. uh, about Santos is that he was not he didn't need to do that. You see, Uribe, yes, because Uribe, it's a populist, and Uribe needs to move to you know to push people and needs you know it's part of of his character. Santos didn't have to do anything. He was you know somebody that represents the 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 statu quo as well. Uribe was not. Uribe was, was an outsider from the statu quo, see? And as populists happens to be always, you know, they are outsiders, see? Uh, but Santos, no. Santos was part of the statu quo, you know, belonged to all these, you know, families in, in Colombia and uh, owned, you know, newspapers and all money, all money, colored money. So Santos was that. Uribe was not. But in another way... No, Uribe was not. Oops. No, was not. No, no, no. His wife. Uribe was not. No, Uribe was an outsider. That's why he was so, so interesting. No, Uribe was an outsider from politics, you know. He didn't belong to the... Yeah, he didn't belong to the... No, he didn't belong to the most important family. You'll have a question at the end, I'm sure, madam. Yeah, you can you can ask me. No, no, no. You, whatever we'll, you we'll want. Be hearing from you later, with pleasure. Okay. But, but but in a way, Uribe is. I mean, the aftermath of the peace process. Yeah. Let's not get to the end too quickly. But at the aftermath of the peace process, it shows that actually, in as much as it challenges a a status quo yeah. in Colombia, Uribe does stand for. I mean, the reaction to the peace process has been violent, formidable, yeah. ruthless, strong. No, uh, what happened was disastrously so. In a way, doesn't doesn't the ferocity of the reaction to the peace process? Um, we'll get to the leaders socialis, the leaders socialis later and everything. But but the, the ferocity of the reaction to the peace process is, is in a way a tribute to the depth of its ambition. Um, that actually it wasn't just to end the war; it was to reshape society in a way that the status quo that Uribe does represent could not tolerate. And uh, so what happened was that Santos decided to move along and do and did at that time what we didn't I mean nobody thought it was he was going to do. He decided not only to dismantle a flag through a peace process, but to uh, create the atmosphere and, uh, and the tools for a new society. That was the important thing about Santos, you know. It was not only a, a peace treaty built on in dismantling a guerrilla. It was a treaty that was willing to change society. And, and that has been the most difficult for Colombians right now because in the, that's the core of the problem because what happened after the plebiscite, plebiscite was lost, Uribe won, you see, 
and not only won the plebiscite, but uh, he they won the presidential elections. Uh, so they are against the core of the pro of 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 the agreement. They are against the the, the reforms. They don't like the reforms. They don't want, they like to preserve the status quo, especially the rural reforms, because Uribe represents that, uh, the, the, um, the countryside, the, 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 the persons that live there, they are much more conservative, as it happens here as well in many countries, you know. So Uribe represents that, the person who feared the most uh, uh, with Las Far because uh, there was no state presence, and so they have to fear all the FARC, you know, going around kidnapping people. So they have built this image that it's important to uh, be strength in terms of of, of pulling out uh, the the FARC. But we know we know FARC anymore. You see, uh, they would have uh, to they they would have no excuse, but. They still are against the social reforms, especially the ones that have, have to do with rural reforms. The rural areas have to be reformed in Colombia because for the last 50 years we haven't even done anything at all. See, so so that's the core of the of the thing. Uh, whether um, Uribe uh, um, it's willing to accept that, I don't know. But what happened? Uh, really is that with Duque, Duque was the next president, I mean, Uribe won, and his candidate won, you know, and the name of the candidate, it's now the, our president named Ivan Duque. What happened was that Ivan Duque, we thought, was going to be a puppet of Uribe, but he's not, not he's not uh, been able to do that. He hasn't, uh, he's, he's, in a certain way, he has been much more independent than we thought, and he is not willing to tear down the peace agreement. He's not willing to tear down the peace agreement, but he's in the middle of all this situation. So, so we don't know what to do, <laughs> but what, what is for sure is that Duque is not tearing down the, the, the peace agreement as Uribe wants to. And so that is a new thing that is coming along, and, and I think that's good the news. The third dynamic. Yeah, it's a third dynamic, and it's. I think it's good news for Colombia. Just, I mean, you know, <clears throat> over those five years in in La Havana and since, you've come to know FARC um, as an outsider um, yeah. pretty well. Can you take us through some of the personalities involved and 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 in the leadership and how did it work in Havana? I mean, five years hammering this out. Um, how do you think it worked? Uh, where did it nearly fall apart, and why? And how did they do it well, in the end? Well, the thing about the guerrilla, it's, it's like uh, the drugs with the big dons, see? That, uh, I mean, the guerrilla of Las Farc was the last guerrilla. Uh, I, would, I would say it was the last guerrilla because it was the last guerrilla in which you can kind of see some of this uh, uh, idyllic um, uh, revolutionary aura that once El Che Guevara uh, um, you know, gave the, the revolutionaries to the revolutionaries. Well, that's far was the last one, you know. But what happened with the guerrilla that for 50 years tries to, you know, fight and fight and doesn't gain the power? I mean, what happened to that guerrilla? Well, that becomes, becomes something quite different from a revolutionary guerrilla, see? It becomes part of the establishment of the illegal establishment, see? Uh, and it's like part of the, of, 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 yeah, of the paramilitary state that in a way they was created in Colombia uh, because they were not able to win the power. So they were left, you know, as, as an important uh, power in certain areas in Colombia, but never were able to gain, you know, to win the war. And, and became as happens in Nicaragua or happened in Cuba. See, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So, so this guerrilla was a very strange guerrilla. It was, it was a guerrilla, you know, you know, completely uh, out, uh, outside from everything that you can imagine. See, uh, but still they would have this sense of 
trying to do what revolutionaries thinks they have to do. It was extraordinary when we were at a, a Camp Diamante of Las Farc together, <clears throat> how little idea they had of how irrelevant they were numerically to Colombian society. I mean, they yeah. had no idea they were going to pull less votes than a soccer stadium. In the, in the they, yeah, they were so separate from, uh, you know, society that they didn't believe, for instance, in public opinion. So how did they hammer they didn't out believe in public that? opinion. So they how did, did the peace process work? How did someone's... Uh, they didn't so apparently believe irrelevant. In, uh, in the state. They didn't believe in, uh, in the, the parliament. They didn't believe in anything. So they didn't know how to deal with the people. With the people in the cities. They didn't know how to speak. They didn't know... Amazing, they were like mammoths. They were... Yeah! So prehistoric! How, but Maria Jimena, how then can this... Jurassic. Yeah, they were Jurassic guerrillas. How, how can there. they then engage generals, diplomats, people like Sergio Yaramillo, the, you know, the, the biggest brains in the, you know available, into a peace process in five over five years? And how did those? Why and how did those generals and, and politicians and diplomats feel <clears throat> obliged to sit it out for five years with these? With, with the comrades. Because even though they were mammoths or Jurassic, I mean, it's a, it was a Jurassic guerrilla, it was a very powerful guerrilla in those regions. And they still keep the power in those regions, you see. Uh, Colombia, it's a v huge country, uh, and the state presence hasn't been very strong. And so in the last 50 years, the FARC have been able to impose their, the, yeah, the the rule of law, what they say is the rule of law, the rule of law, their rule of law. So that's why it was important, <coughs> because a guerrilla means, it's not only a revolutionary guerrilla means, you know, that they want to gain the power in order for them to change the, 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 um, the society. A guerrilla means as well, you know, the capacity you have to control territory. So they control territory. And uh, if you control territory, you could wage a war. And the war was really something that we, FARC and the society, wanted to stop. And this was the last, the, the, the last war in the continent, still there. So there were many reasons, you know, human reasons, you know, it's mainly human, uh, personal reasons as well uh, for many. But what was interesting for me, the, the most interesting thing was that when I saw in La Habana the military ranking officers that had fought the war for the last 40 years and the guerrilleros that had the, the, did the same thing, you know, they sat together in this negotiation table and in the middle they see each other, they saw each other's eyes. They had this contact immediately and they started out a new relation and they managed to finish very quickly the DIR negotiation in which you you have to find the way to dismantle a guerrilla. And they did it very quickly, very quickly. Uh, for instance, in the um, Good Friday Agreement, that, that, that part of the negotiation took two years. We did it in six months. In six months. Because of this relationship, Amazing relationship that that was you know that in a moment of of I don't know why because the war and it's so uh, difficult to really understand how how <coughs> gets you as a human being you know they discovered that they were not longer enemies and that they have to build together the road for the peace and they did it. <coughs> Having said that, I mean, and uh, you know. <laughs> Amazing, you know, you saw them, you know, laughing and trying mm. to, you know, uh, in, uh, exchange different experience from an operation in which, you know, the captain was wanting to kill the guy who's sitting in, you know, in front of him. And they, they even remembered was, specific moments yeah, in the war specific when ones they said, had no, been no, you to were wanting to kill me. Yeah, but I went out. I was, I was the guy you left for dead in the jungle. No, it was ones. amazing. Yeah. So yeah. that that was something that had really struck me at uh, and I think that's a characteristic that you would find, especially in this agreement in Colombia. As I told you, the Good Friday Agreement was 
you know, you never saw this sort of approach in, in, in uh, you know, in, an, in the, both armies, if you would say. It was, was not, didn't happen, nor, nor in the Nepal case, nor in, I mean, nor in many other uh, uh, peace agreements. This was something that was very characteristic for, of the Colombian case. Um, <clears throat> every, every Colombian and, and, and you good people here now get, get us fed up with um, people talking about cocaine as, as an Irish man or woman does when you say you're from Ireland and they start making jokes about Jellignite. But um, narco-traffic is a kind of 500-pound gorilla sitting in the room and a crucial part of the peace process, a crucial clause in the peace process, an attempt to get as close towards the eradication of coca production as is possible. Um, recognising that, of course, is impossible, as it's turned out to be. Um, you know, as well as sort of kidnapping people and tying them to trees and killing them, FARC um, proceeded from being what they call themselves a, a tax uh, levier uh, on yeah, cocaine yeah, production yeah. to basically a cartel in their own right. Um, those of you following the El Chapo Guzman trial will, in New York will perhaps have been sort of rather bitterly amused by his first appearance on a wiretap when he's actually discussing and rather estimably haggling with a FARC operative over the price of a load. Um, uh, how does all this, I mean, you know, your first book is about Escobar, um, uh, or one of your first books about Escobar, uh, early books about Escobar, um, the, the, the presence of narcotrafico is in the peace agreement, crucially, yeah. but it's also in the bitter aftermath. Um, uh, uh, FARC, your comparison with Ireland and contrast with Ireland are fascinating. We must get on to victims later, because that was Ireland's um, omission. Um, but the levels of dissent from the IRA were much, much lower and smaller than the levels of yeah. dissent from FARC. I mean, there was always this idea, you know, what what businessman is going to say to the to the leadership? Why do we abandon this wonderful business model of cocaine, the perfect product? Why why do you want to stop making money? And a lot of the dissenters are, of course, basically just now narco traffickers. How does narco traffic fit into all this? Because it, it has a place, however awkward. Well, it has a, a you know a huge huge importance because I think one of the reasons that FARC decided to. A go to La Habana and start out a peace negotiation was because of the drug trafficking business. Since they didn't win, you see, they were just, you know, imagine a guerrilla that still there is, you know, after 50 years, you're still there. You see, and you are funneling your war through the business, cocaine business. So if you don't win, well, you would end up being a drug dealer, you see. And that for for guerrilleros that thought, they, they think themselves they think uh, you know you can you have to understand what a guerrillero means I mean psychologically speaking they think they are revolutionaries you see and that they have a sort of a an idyllic way of seeing things and that they are fighting for change see but all of a sudden that picture, you know, it's gone when you end up doing drugs. See? So they knew that if they were not, they would not go to this peace process, you know, they would end up being a, a, a drug dealer like a chapel or worse, see. And uh, I think that that was a very important argument and that, that brought them to, to the peace agreement and to the peace table. But on the other hand, uh, Drugs have always been, you know, in, you know, in, 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 been there in the conflict, you know, always, you know, from the very beginning, from Pablo Escobar. But what it's amazing is that when you see what happens with Chapo trial, when you hear Chapo speaking, well, he barely speaks. I don't know if you understand Spanish, but if you hear Pat, ¿cómo se llama este señor? Watch talking. I mean, he talks like a peasant. He doesn't even have to write, you see. I mean, he's, he's really not, uh, I mean, he's not uh, the, the, he hasn't got the appeal that a don has to have, yeah? In order for you to be a don, you have to be John Gotti in New York. Well, has something to do with the, the way he, in, he, Il uomo di onore. The, their business, <laughs> see. 
and uh, Don Gotti uh, and uh, all these uh, important uh, mafiosis in in Italia. They had they had certain level of of intellectual ability. You see, well, the same same happened with Pablo Escobar. I think that's the last really dawn. See, in, on dro of dro I mean, talking about drugs. Of course, you would have different ones, but in terms of 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 the power of the of of Pablo Escobar, you see, Pablo Escobar was wanting to run the country. Was he w was wanting to become president of Colombia, using drugs, and uh, uh, actually, he he used the drugs to climb up the ladder and to became what he became. But he was very clever, as John Gotti did, and he was wanting to run the country, and he was really doing the same thing that the Mafia in Sicilia did, you know. They care for the people that they thought they were their people, you see. And they were very good, as the Sicilian Mafia was with the people that were part of the Sicilian, yeah, well, the, they, they had this protection, you know, this, this way of protect people, of course. It, I mean, it was a very weird protection, but anyhow, they have this sense of protection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in Colombia, I tell you the truth, yeah, they feared him a lot. But listen, in Medellin, was, was, he was uh, somebody that uh, uh, the, politici the, politi the politicians used to, to use to, to because what? he was, I mean, he had money to pour into the uh, poorer neighborhoods and, uh, well, people loved him. Well, Envigado as well, but I, I tell you something. I covered, I covered, I covered the, their. Listen, you know, I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm a victim of Pablo Escobar. So, so don't worry. I was victim of Pablo Escobar. So, I, I was victim. So don't, don't, don't think I'm, I'm trying to, so, to be, you know, pro Pablo. I am victim of Pablo. I was victim. I'm still, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm still facing lots of problems because of Pablo Escobar. So. So don't get me wrong. So don't get me wrong. So, and um, you know, don't get me wrong. So, but how does this infuse the peace process? I mean, one of the best examples of how you know peace is tough and peace can actually be quite dull. Yeah. <clears throat> was this program in Tumaco, Simias por la Paz? Well, it's all over Colombia. Seeds for peace, and there we were down in in, in Tumaco, and it, it's the world's most concentrated and thereby violently contested coca growing areas in the world. Yeah. And there are the guys from the Ministry of Agriculture going around trying to assemble cocaleros and persuading them to swap for uh, cacao, Didn't for work. date palm, whatever. And then th they enter the program, 7,000 at the last count, 7,000 this, roughly this time last year, waiting to join the program. That's that's hard work. And then someone comes along in the night, Pedrito, I hear you've joined the program. Oh, I don't think so. Um, you know, th th this is, Escobar is another discourse at one level, but at this level it's integral to the peace process. I mean, the whole idea of yeah, voluntary eradication, patient hard work by agronomists to persuade people to yeah. switch to another crop. I mean, it's extraordinary to watch. Yeah, we don't and, have and poignant any, too, because it doesn't always work. We don't have any more Escobar. Escobar's in Colombia, but we do have gangs that still are trying to grow coca and to push people into the business, you see. And what happened with the agreement was that the Santos decided to uh, help those people in order for, you know, in a way found uh, uh, found them a way window of opportunity that could bring them out from the business, see. It didn't work. It didn't work. Why? Because uh, the implementation process was very slow, you see. And so there are many people, you know, trying to go out from that business, but they haven't been able to find out the tools because the state hasn't been able to to present them a, so, a solution. So so that's been has been very difficult to accomplish. Right now, that's, I think, one of the most biggest problems that this government the new government is facing you know how to you know to bring these people into the legal uh, business you know into legal business uh, it, and it's been very tricky you need mu too much money to do that and 
and still you have well, all the these gangs. The piece is expensive, that's the other thing. And the piece is expensive, but on the other hand, you have all these gangs, you know, there, mm. that still, I mean, they're, they're still there because the business is, is booming, and we do have uh, much more numbers of hectares. You don't have hectares here, no? Hectares, no. You it's have called acres, but acres, never mind. we won't go there. It's, just, it's too far for pictures. <laughs> Of of coca plantation, so so that's one of the biggest, uh, yeah. Things before that before we, we get to now. questions, I'd like the fourth official needs to do you know, the, the, when we when we're five minutes away from questions because we've got to talk about the actual reporting of this at the end and your work. Um, but <clears throat> we have to talk about victims. Um, I mean, the Irish peace treaty was you know one of the well arguably probably the only recent achievement of British politics um, uh, uh, not bad to be honest by present standards um, but the as we're as is becoming clearer and clearer the victims were not part of that and there are now the disappearances and all this it's it's, it's they weren't involved they were yeah. at, at the center of the of the Havana those five years in Havana yeah. one of the most interesting things I think was how the areas that had suffered most from the war voted most in, most uh, overwhelmingly for the peace. And people who had suffered most from the FARC were invariably among those most supportive of the peace process. That was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Do take us through that. The thinking behind it, and, and um, from your own observations and conversations, especially I think with Sergio Yaramillo, who was, f was yeah. forceful about this, um, and, um, and, and how and why that happened and where it, where it, where it is now. Well, I think that one of the problems of, of Colombia and this ongoing war was the impunity uh, with justice, as you see. Uh, all the victims, you know, regarding, you know, victims from the drug uh, dealers, Pablo Escobar at that moment, then the paramilitary squads and then Las Farc, uh, would have to face uh, impunity. And, and that was the problem that the big problem that we have to solve. And uh, for that matter, the peace agreement made, I think, w a, a, an interesting uh, a scenario. They decided that the core of the program, of the, of the implementation process, would have to be the victims, the core. I mean, you know, for instance, in Northern Ireland, victims, the word, doesn't exist. I mean, victims were not part of the agreement in the Good Friday Agreement. In Colombia, that was something that we uh, victims, because I'm a victim, you know, not only from, of a victim of Pablo Escobar, but I'm a victim of all the actors in the conflict. See, so victims pushed harder, you know, into uh, because we were wi wanting to put that on the court of the business of, of the agreement. So we went to La Habana even, you know, and faced Las Farc and face the members of, of, of the army. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, moment uh, for Colombians. For the first time, we were able to say what we had to say, you know, uh, and to, in a way, talk about impunity and how this, this way, you know, uh, has hurt society. But well, how did that work? Because the transitional justice clause so, in the treaty is also related to this and very so interesting. To make a long story short, what they did uh, and they agreed with Las Farc was to build for the first time the a, 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 a tribunal, a tribunal that for the first time in the world, you know, it's going to be uh, um, a, tri a, a, a tribunal uh, that it's going to be a, um, a part of a, an experiment. All the actors that have uh, committed, you know, crimes, let, let us say FARC, members of the army, members of uh, civilians that helped to, you know, funded paramilitary squads, would have to submit themselves under this tribunal, you know, and for the first time in the world would have, we're going to have that experience. We're going to be, you know, kind of a guinea pigs on, on, on this because, you know, no, there is no other example and this is going to be the first one. Uh, we are uh, starting from scratches and right now we, all the magistrates of the new tribunal have been appointed. It's going to be a transitional justice tribunal, you know, 
no prison. No prison would be, uh, you know, there is no prison, only transitional justice. And, uh, well, we are opening up a new chapter in Colombia. And uh, I think it's good because for the victims in Colombia, you know, for the first time in our history, victims, victims are, are going, going to be in the core of, of the solution, see? And I think it's very important because impunity has led lots of problems. I mean, has led Colombia, you know, uh, as a society completely, you know, in a burst of, of, of the worst of, of the nightmares that you can imagine because a human being needs, needs especially, you know, justice. I mean, justice, whatever justice, you know, if it's prison, okay, if it's not prison, and if it's, you know, you can find many ways of, of justice, but, but you need that to heal. You need justice, you need truth to heal as a society. And if you don't have it, you won't heal, see? And so, so this is the way we decided to heal in Colombia. Are we going to do it? We don't know. Well, I mean, that, that, I think perhaps what I might do is after questions is just ask you that question at the very end of the session. But the penultimate question, before we throw it open, I think that's about right, isn't it, is, um, is this professionally, you know, this is, a, this is a, also you know, a journalist's institution devoted, as Vaughan Smith says, to eating, drinking, and thinking, and I hope we'll do all of those. Um, You know, for the combat journalists in this room and watching, and there are there are there are there are a lot of us. There's more PTSD per, per capita in this place than most others. What's the difference between reporting war and peace? Well, one is obvious. One is war. The other is peace. But but it's different. It's tougher. It's weird, isn't it? I mean, to be a, you've been a peace yeah, correspondent now for oh, eight years. Yeah, yeah, for eight years. That's um, the nine. How does, nine. A, how does a peace correspondent? approach the subject in a way that a war correspondent. Very weird, I would tell you. First, because you know what I've learned? There are many lessons that I've learned, you know. In war, the society keeps together. That's awful. But it's part of the war, you know. Kind of keeps together, you know. Why? Because you have something, a goal to, to accomplish, you see. A war is something that keeps together people. Peace, no. Right. So peace brings polarization, you know, and especially when you have, um, you know, a bad experiment as, as the plebiscite or, you know, same happened in the Brexit, when you have a polarized society, you know. So, so that's very difficult because you, uh, and, 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 and the third thing, which we didn't have before was, Fake news, <laughs> uh, the internet, and uh, the use of the news, uh, the fake news, and how you can transform people's wills, you know. And uh, I think that's that's very difficult to to I mean to address as a journalist, especially a, a journalist that have always been covering wars and that is a victim of the war, you know. I, sometimes I said, you know, oh, it was much more easy before. See, do the generals and guerrillas yeah. like talking about <laughs> peace? Do they? Do they? No, they, but because you became a lot of, I mean, you became aware of things that you thought they didn't exist. See, for instance, you became aware uh, of corruption. See, and uh, you became aware of things that have to do with education, with social reforms, with reforms. You see, that sort of things that you, I mean, on a way, we are, we are transforming us in a much more civil society, normal society, but it's becoming very difficult to cover uh, as a journalist and as a Colombian as well, because peace means many things, you see, many things. Personally speaking, I think that we don't have still peace in Colombia, that we have to build it. But that process is very difficult because you have to kind of find the way to address uh, the polarization. And the polarization really is hurting uh, Colombia and the society that needs to heal. 
<laughs> so we are on one hand in the process of healing, and but on the other we are in the process of of, of falling apart as a society because of the polarization. And I tell you the truth, I don't mind polarization when it's in the right measure, you know, in the right standards. I think that we have the right of, you know, think whatever we want and uh, that your neighbor has the same right. That's not the problem. I like that. That's that's what I do, uh, actually. But, <laughs> but other thing quite different is when you don't see or hear it's uh, the other person that is in front of you. And you need to heal as a society. So, so that's, and, and as a reporter, it's been very tricky to explain what is peace. <laughs> <laughs> very much. I mean, I've been, I, I tried to write a book because, yeah, just trying to answer that question. And I don't know if I've been successful this book. <laughs> and because of that, you know, kind of, of obsession that I have, you know, how to explain what the peace meant or means still, it's been a tricky thing. And I've been writing three or four, I mean, I have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer of books and I've been very, you know, I, for me it's been, has been very difficult to really address that issue. I haven't been able to answer that question very much, indeed. <laughs> well, <coughs> we'll go to questions now and then back to you at the end, which is, I know it's not how you're supposed to do it, but I'm going to. This is in translation, in the process of translation now with HarperCollins, and, but is available in Spanish on Amazon.es. Uh, if for anyone who, I mean, I, it's a wonderful piece of work because it's about both peace and, and the man. Now, we know you want to ask a question, and we'll make a point. Um, yeah. Can I just no, remind you, you, one? Do you No, yeah. a question, no, a point, I think. Well, so. you, you've got something to say. Um, but welcome. But, but, but so welcome. For the sake of the right. license. No, so welcome. Others. You're welcome so to make a point. Over to you. That's the idea. Can we please remember to use the microphone so people on there can hear it? Please, please keep your questions, questions short, questions, questions, and. Disagree agreeably. Now, of course, that's. Ed, do you want to pick the questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, look, you, you, you're going to go first on with other people. Shh, just a sec. Right. Okay. Make a and, point. And other people will want to okay, make a point as well. I'm not a journalist. I'm a social worker. I come from Colombia, Medellin, and I've been here 30 years. Okay? Uh -huh. I have a family in Colombia. Uh, we've been through all that. We suffer. We lost people with Pablo Escobar, with everything. I think Santos has done a fantastic thing with the peace process. With the peace process. I think Alvaro Uribe had a different situation from Santos. Alvaro Uribe had to try to sort out when the FARC wasn't talking about peace. Uh, he had the states, the United States. Use the uh, sorry, <laughs> the United <laughs> States, who, okay, some of us don't like, some do, but I think he did the best he could. If you think uh, he is one of the few presidents, honest presidents, because there is lots of corruption in Colombia, and he did try his best. And he did quite well. Now it's different. He has changed. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have, do you have a specific question? Because okay. then we can bring the so, answer. Okay. okay. You talk about the peace process, what they did. My point is they gave too much. How is the Colombia going to give them so much if it doesn't have it? Can I uh, ask, answer or what? Just, just okay. yeah. because we've got okay. a lot of people Perfect. waiting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Several times later in those peace talks in La Habana, FARC used to raise this issue of safety. In the past, guerrillas who tried to enter politics tended to get assassinated. We're seeing a whole right wave of assassinations now. The social leaders. The social leaders in the countryside, the sort of thing that the, the Shining Light used to do in Peru, too. If you, if you raised your hand to try and help people, you tended to get shot. How destabil how potentially destabilizing is that for the process? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you, want to, do you want to take that now? Uh, <coughs> I don't need a microphone. Okay, so 
Yes, you know what happened because of what is interesting is that uh, for the first time we haven't seen members of Las FARC being killed. You see, before we had, this is not our first time that we do a peace process with the guerrilla. Uh, 25 years ago we did it with LM-19, the smallest guerrilla, uh, terrific guerrilla as well. And um, at that time, almost all the ranking members of Las Vegas were ki of uh, M19 were killed after they settled down the peace process. They were killed, assassinated, you know. But this time, didn't happen. <coughs> so that's a good sign. Didn't happen. I mean, all the members of Las Vegas that were part, of, you know, of the of the. Uh, table in the, in the in La Habana still alive and members of the Congress what it's uh, it's dreadful I mean, what, what, what is really happening that we didn't expect that as to happen is, was, is, is that we're seeing right now the killings of the social uh, leaders those who are trying to change things and that they're facing in many regions the the the, the the, the the presence or the the, the pressure uh, done by the ones who, who want to preserve the status quo so they are facing that sort of, of ambiguity in those regions and they are being killed they are facing you know all this this mm, force that doesn't want to change anything and they are being killed and uh, the only thing that we have to do it's always the same thing strengthen the state presences in those regions but for that matter i mean we haven't been able to do it you know the last 60 years we haven't been able to do it so so it's a matter of willing to do it but now we're better off than before i think so and and, uh, and and keeping up with uh, with your question, I I don't think that um, we gave much. Uh, I mean, we gave everything to Las Farc. That's that's something that uh, was very. Um, I mean, uh, um, that that was uh, uh, President Uribe, former President Uribe, decided that the, that was one of the arguments, the big arguments. Uh, they arose in the in the moment in which we were doing the campaign for the plebiscite. Uh, he said that the uh, peace agreement was not good for the country because we, they, they, mm, er, everything was being given to La Farc. Well, I don't think so. No, 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 I disagree. So <coughs> but but say, are they going to be able to give everything? Ah, so, so that's, no, no, no. So what happens is that we didn't deliver. So the big quest that right now we're having is to really, you know, uh, find the tools and find the institutions that we have to build in order for strengthen the presence in those regions. Therefore, you know, that's the way we can uh, um, open the, the, the window for the rural reforms and for the, all these things that have to come. And yes, things are moving, not as fast as we want, but they're moving, they're moving. Amazingly enough, they're moving. See, so they're moving. Uh, yes, I wanted to um, ask you about the threats to the peace process. I read that ELN is a force yeah. now, and is it a credible force? Is it a credible alternative? Also, the implementation process, there's a lot of people unsatisfied with the money they're receiving or not receiving. Um, the, le the, the leaders assassinados, we, we talked about it, and also drugs. Yet only yesterday or a few days ago, an American soldier was caught, uh, and the production of cocaine apparently uh, is as rich as more than ever. Is, is more than yeah. ever. What, what does the future hold according to your experience of what you've been witnessing in, uh, in Colombia? Well, I, I think much. that, uh, thank you very much for the, well, first, the implementation process, it's, uh, it's you know, in the middle of all these changes, political changes. The good news is that President Duque doesn't want to tear down the process and he's willing to uh, improve all these uh, uh, rural reforms that have to do with the implementation process. But on the other hand, uh, I would have to tell you that the big quest we have right now is how to um, build up a coherent policy towards public opinion to understand that what is important for Colombia in terms of the peace process. 
because we are dealing with different uh, problems right now. Maduro, I don't know, if President Maduro, President Maduro, I'm talking about ELN. That's what I'm. What happened is that when we finish the war, we end up a war and we start another one, just on the other uh, country. See, Venezuela. What happens in Venezuela? See, it's it's really uh, uh, you know difficult and, and and dangerous for for the region. ELN is the last guerrilla. I, I, I always say that La Farga is the last guerrilla because that's true. But it's not the last in Colombia. <laughs> see? See? Uh, mm, there's still a guerrilla, you know, still that we, we are trying to see if we can open up a, 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 a peace dialogue with the ELN, but I don't think we're going to be successful. ELN is a very small guerrilla founded by, Fa by, by Fidel Castro back in the 60s. Fidel Castro founded ELN. El ELN, it's called. So what happens is that it's a very small guerrilla. It's entrenched in the um, nearby the territory that uh, it's um, um, in the it's in the border of Venezuela. And what is happening right now is that ELN, it's I think 80% of the ELN lives on the Venezuela border side. And is helping the regime to survive. See, he works as a paramilitary force, crosses the uh, border, and became a guerrilla. See, and so so one day it's a guerrilla, and on the other day it's a paramilitary force in Venezuela, and they're very small. But um, President uh, Duque is trying to um, um, open up a, a peace negotiation with ELN. So I don't think it's going to be successful because they are hooked up with Maduro, and Maduro needs them, you see? So I don't think that's going to be successful. So th this is a guerrilla that's going to, to tra be transformed in a paramilitary squad that would help the regime in Maduro, uh, Maduro's regime, you see? So that's one thing. But the other thing we're having is that we're having Tons of people coming out from Venezuela. Uh, I think there was human rights that tell, uh, told last uh, month that uh, the second human um, uh, see, uh, exodus, exodus or something <coughs> like that uh, uh, in the world is the one that we're facing. You, we have a, a, around three million uh, Venezolanos coming into Colombian territory without any, I mean, they come barefoot. See, barefoot, with nothing, you know, because they are really, you know, facing the worst moment in, in, in Venezuela. So, so look what happened. We end up a war <laughs> successfully in many ways, see, but we had to face this new one that it's coming along and that we don't know how to face it because this is quite different. This is quite, quite different. And I don't think Maduro is going to, I think Maduro is going to last, unfortunately. And, and it's going to last because we don't see, you know, any sort of, of way out in, in Venezuela. So, so that is going to worsen the situation in Colombia in terms of refugees, in terms of human rights conditions. And uh, um, the other thing is that we never faced so much immigration. Uh, nobody wanted to go to Colombia. Tell you the truth, up to now, planet, lonely planet, planet <laughs> lonely planet, put <laughs> Colombia for you know, two days, two years ago, three years ago, as a you know, as a as a destination, be tourist destination. But that, that just happened three <laughs> years ago. So, but before, never, nobody wanted to go to Colombia. So look what happened. You know, we have tons of Venezuelans coming up in, and and so so, yeah, well. That is what is happening in my country. But before we move on, our friend did also ask about drugs, if I may. I mean, you, you, ah, I mean, Santos, so in two th before the peace process, he got up at the at the OAS and said, we want to rewrite the whole thing. Uh, yeah. It's down to you. You launder the money. It's your nose is snorting, your veins injecting the stuff. You're part of this. And actually, it is extraordinary how little impact that has had, as, as, as um, yeah. our friend pointed out. You know, there's now more cocaine coming out of Colombia than ever. Yeah. No, and I think that that's the only thing that I have. I, I think it's it's didn't work for Colombians and for the world that in the midst of all this process, the number of acres of coca that we had tripled. 
due to many reasons, mainly because of, of the, mm, the, the, mm, the prices of the oil, you know, and the commodities went down, you see. And so people uh, that were working in other areas, in areas that would have to do with illegal minery, uh, they had to again go back to the coca, uh, 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 the coca grow, uh, to grow coca. They had to, I mean, they moved to grow coca and, and so, but many reasons, and as well, the peace process uh, helped a lot because, in a way, uh, we were not uh, waging a war, and um, in a way that helped us w as well to improve the. I mean, people were not having, you know, the military there, so so they, they, in a way, that helped to improve the numbers of acres uh, of coca. So we have right now lots of coca, meaning that uh, the business. It's, it's not good because of the price, but it's <coughs> you would have coca in the market. And um, we have to face that as a, as a huge problem. But, you know, at the bottom of that, it's always the policy. And I always keep on saying the same thing that Santos said. If we still wage the war on drugs uh, with the same tools that we've been wa waging, the war on drugs, for the last 30 years, we're gonna lose. Uh, we we're gonna lo I mean we're gonna lose the war because that's I mean we the only way you can do that is uh, you know we know how but we are not going to do it uh, and I tell you the truth Colombia done everything first we dismantled Medellin cartel Pablo Escobar then we dismantled Medellin eh, eh, perdón Cali cartel then we dismantled Norte del Valle cartel. Then we dismantle, uh, no, we didn't dismantle more because we didn't have more. And then up the Medellin, no, the uh, Mexican cartels appeared. They came to Colombia buying the drug. And uh, uh, as well, you know, they have, they, um, Guacho, no, Guacho, no, but, uh, Guacho. Chapo, 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 Chapo sorry. was caught. Do you think that that is going to really have an impact in the, in the production? No, as he told not Penn, at this all. Will go on I forever. mean, it's not going to move anything, and so, so that's. I mean, the way in which we are waging the 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 war on drugs is always, you know, it's it's gonna be, you know, it will never be an unwinnable. It's an unwinnable war, and Santos had this approach, and, and as a Nobel Prize, he did that, and uh, I th I think he's still doing the same thing, and he and I think he's on the right track. We have to change everything. But it's going to be very difficult if all the pr consumer countries are not willing to do it. And so that's the only thing is that Santos did have the courage to do that at the United Nations. And he did it. Didn't work. Now we're in a kind of could stay here all night situation. And it's not a, bad, it's not, it's a good one to be in. It's your call, Austin. Uh, let's try and get everyone in if we can. Thank you. Could you talk about what progress has been made towards bringing people to justice? And um, also, can you talk about the use of sexual violence during the war? Thank you. <coughs> well, that's, that's something very new in Colombia. And I think it, for the first time, it's been addressed in a peace agreement. The sexual uh, crime, and the sexual crimes uh, towards women, especially. And so... For the first time that it's been addressed in this uh, tribunal, new tribunal, and um, it's been very difficult for Las Farc to acknowledge that uh, because uh, they think they were very machistas, you know. Las Farc was very conservative uh, guerrilla and a very machista guerrilla. And so they didn't acknowledge that. The gender issue, it's very new for them. It's barely, you know, f the last two years. And so they are, in a way, trying to open up that sort of new story and they are facing the trials on, on, on sexual uh, crimes. But not only as fact, all the actors of the conflict that have been involved in on those crimes are now facing the trial. We're starting. So the first thing we're doing is uh, uh, we are uh, the the magistrates have called only Las Farc. See, so Las Farc have been there, you know, facing all the the 
the, the, the charges, see? And we still have to wait to see what happens with the military, yeah? Uh, for the, we have only one military being charged, uh, but still we have yet to see more, see? So, so it's a different Colombia. <laughs> uh, for me, it's an, a striking moment, you see? Because really, for the first time, we're seeing something that it's really happening and that it's against impunity which I think is the core of all this, this thing. And I think many people in the world are seeing very thoroughly what is going to happen in this tribunal. Because for the first time, this is a new one. This is the first experiment. And uh, if we failed, well, we failed. But uh, if we don't, I think it's going to be a very important moment uh, in order for to re replicate this this. this uh, example that we've been doing in Colombia and uh, it's a mixture of everything and uh, yeah it's a Colombian made me yeah <laughs> it's a Colombian como se dice? how do you say hecho in Colombia made in Colombia hecho in Colombia that's it um, I just want to ask how do you deal with the death threats as a journalist that's covering this and because historically journalists that cover this one in Colombia always get killed so how have you dealt with the death threats, your name being on lists and things like that? I well, so it's been, you know, I, when I became a journalist, I thought it was because it was nice to travel. <laughs> yeah, I was wanting to travel. And I thought, you know, my father was a journalist and I always loved how he traveled and how he interviewed people. But I never thought it was going to you know, have all these nightmares, nightmares that I had, you know, uh, uh, since then, uh, and uh, it, it, it just all of a sudden everything changed in Colombia, and at the age of 20, my life has changed so much that, you know, my editor in chief was killed, see. Uh, um, the unit we were, I mean, was dismantled, the investigative unit that was um, created by the um, uh, Guillermo Cano, who was killed, later killed by Pablo Escobar, was dismantled. And then a bomb, they, they bombed us. The newspaper was bombed, you see. The newspaper, and you know, at the age of 25, I was, you know, I had too many people killed, friends killed. Uh, so I said, you know, this is not possible. I mean, what on earth is happening in this country? And uh, my sister, you know, was doing a documentary for Channel 4, on an issue that um, I was investigating, actually. But because I had to leave the country due to the death threats, uh, my, mm, uh, as a, I was the producer of the documentary, my sister took my place. And so he, she became involved. And after four months, um, she was uh, kind of having a, this last uh, chat with the peasants because the idea was to uh, Hooked up to to show the story of uh, of a passions in, in in a certain part of Colombia in a region in Colombia uh, that they were wanting to stop the war and that they were trying to do their own um, little and small uh, peace agreement you know so they were talking with last Friday they were talking with the members of the military they were talking with the drugs dealers so they were th trying to build up his own little peace you see and all of a sudden you know. Um, uh, a gang or no, a paramilitary squad end up, you know, uh, they open fire in the restaurant at 9 p.m. and they killed, uh, they killed my sister and the four peasants in a massacre. That was one of the m dozens of massacres that came along, you know, and so, so, it's a very difficult moment there because you 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 then you know, you you didn't say well, if I had to do my job uh, and in doing my job my life it's at stake this job is not worth it but if I don't do my job <laughs> see God what happens then if I don't do my job more people are going to be killed so I just decided you know that we have to face that um, sort of schizophrenic way of living, see, 
and I, I, I think uh, Ed knows that sort of, of way of living, no, verdad? And it's a crazy thing because I've learned how to do my job, knowing that I might be killed, and that's abs ab that's nonsense. That's not the way journalism should be, and that's why I was so keen when President Santos decided to stop the war. Because I always desire to have a country without, you know, with the desire of living and not having the, um, um, I mean, the death beneath you, you know, always, all the time. I always hope that we will reach that, that, that country, and to, to see that country. I don't know if we're going to be successful, but I've always think that we deserve that. <laughs> if there's anywhere in the world that does, <laughs> it's Colombia. <Yeah. laughs> Do we wrap? No, I, and I, I just want to say something, you know, for Colombians, this is very important because when, when you have been there always, you know, losing things, losing uh, people, uh, it's very important. This, this peace agreement was very important because that gives you, or we thought that was the moment in which you would have the opportunity to be a normal person, a normal country, with all the desires as a human being has, you know. But, and, and that's why we support this peace agreement. And I support this peace agreement as a journalist. And that took you, uh, took, took us a lot of, <laughs> because work of work and time, yes, yeah, to do. But anyhow, that was, well, there are very few who would have done it the way you've done it, for sure. Uh, should we just take the last, the three? Um, can we keep it, well, Austin, it's over to you, but I think we're kind of, you know, it's, we're in extra time. Also, this, this our, our, our beloved Maria Jimena is on holiday, and we aim to have well, her back no on it within about 20 minutes. Um, okay. Um, I want to thank you, Maria Jimena. I am Colombia's Colombian as well, and I'm starting here exactly for for the peace process, um, and it's like so happy to have you here in London to to teach in like everybody else what's going on. And my question basically is, what do you think like is like the challenges that have the journalists now in the in the after the peace process like. Um, newspaper and social media, they are important actors. What do you think journalists have to do now to uh, stop that pro polarization and that like everything, like the fake news and all that's going on after the peace process has, has gone to an end? I think right now journalists in all over the world have to fight for democracy, all over the world, all over the world in my country, in the United States, in Brazil, <laughs> in every world in, uh, for democracy, because we take for granted many things, you see. Uh, and uh, those things uh, are probably disappearing, or about to disappear if we don't fight. I always think that journalism, or I don't know, I didn't think that when we, I began and, and began being a journalist. I didn't think that journalism has to do with, with, with something that has uh, to do with democracy or with you know, rule of law or, or rights. But now, of course I had to. I, I, I think that that is part of a journalist. The journalist that doesn't think that he has to do his job uh, mm, in terms of, of keeping up with democracy and what democracy means, I don't think he, he must be journalist. I think we have to be the keepers of democracy. Otherwise, this democracy that we take any, for granted, it's going to disappear. And I don't like populism. I don't like, I mean, and before we were the only ones who were facing populism, but now it's the world, you see. So journalists has to stick with, with what is important in democracy, fight for the rights, fight for the, uh, what is important, for the gender issues, for the minorities, for the right of the people, for, for, I don't know, for the right of being uh, everything. I mean, for, for 
democracy is very important. And it's been, when we start out fighting for the, when I remember Pablo Escobar decided that he was going to rule the country, we had to go out and fight for democracy when I was 20 years old. Fight for democracy. This is not my job. Pero por qué? I don't have to do it. Well, we had to. And still, I think, that was the right thing. They put us, I mean, that put us in the, you know, in the first row and we were killed. Many people were killed. But if we hadn't had, did, did that at that time, I think Colombia would have been another country, you see? So, so I think we have to keep on doing that in a different way. And now the good news is that everybody in the world as a journalist has to keep on doing that because the problem is it's in around the world. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Brava. <laughs> and are we going to? I think we'll call it a day later. Uh, right. Well, I'm sorry for people who haven't got there. The the la ultima, la ultima, la ultima. Yeah, sorry. It's the question about it's the question about impunity, and I want to ask in the context of impunity, uh, what's your view of the Santiago Uribe trial, and the effect on impunity, and his uh, he's on trial for paramilitary activities, and he's uh, the president's brother. I'm impressed of how much information you have. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's been a very difficult thing to cope with justice because. What is happening right now is that uh, the traditional justice is not working, you see. Traditional justice is not working because it's been politicized uh, due to many reasons, but mainly because the fiscal, what we call here the attorney general, the attorney general that was being appointed, that was appointed at that moment and still is, um, decided not to do too much. On, on that sort of case, see? And uh, so, so many people think that if traditional justice doesn't work, well, they might end in the transitional justice, that it's working. Whether it's better for the country to do that, I don't know. But what is happening right now is traditional justice, especially that case, it's being able to you know, find the, the, the way out. Why? Because there are lots of powers, huge powers that are against that case. They want to free um, uh, Santiago Uribe. They want to free Santiago Uribe. And so, and, and there are so many, um, I mean, uh, um, reasons for really charging him. Uh, the tons of, of documents, tons of, but justice hasn't been able to do it because they don't have the courage to confront Uribe, his Uribe's brother. So you don't do that. Uh, but what, what is happening in Colombia is that if transition of justice does work, they might go to the transition of justice in order not for not to, to talk about, talking about impunity. Well, Transition of justice must open up, you know, probably must open up that, that, that case. It's como una cervecita aguila fresca. La, la última es ahora, la penúltima. Uh, <laughs> Madam, this is the última. Last one, so I'll try to make it <laughs> good. Last orders. Um, I appreciate that you are so optimistic about the uh, Colombian future. Sometimes I'm not that optimistic. But um, you mentioned the awareness that has come up from all these corruption, um, rural reform, narco-traffic, all these things. And you also um, mentioned democracy as the exit or what needs, needs to be strengthened in order to make the proper institutions so that all the peace uh, things and the jurisdiction and all these things are doable. Um, do you think um, a constitutional assembly would be something useful for Colombia or could we fall into Venezuela's case and having like a populist leader or, or, or not achieving the proper institutions to implement the agreement? Well, I think uh, Colombians, uh, I always want 
thinking that if we have a, a new constitution, uh, we are going to solve our problems. Uh, that happens quite often in our history. That, that is why we have so many constitutions. <laughs> And look what happened, you know, we just end up 30, 40, no, 50 years of, of, of war with three constitutions. So constitutions, I mean, the United States has uh, one constitution and it's three pages, you see. This peace agreement, 297 pages. Good Friday agreement, 23 pages. <coughs> wow says something about Colombian... <laughs> Peace is tough. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think every, everyone of my age, my generation, owes it to the young people here to tear up pretty much every, every belief we've ever held. Um, given the mess we've left you. Um, but I'm still pretty sure that peace is better than war. Um, so yeah. please will you join me in thanking, from the bottom of all our hearts, the great peace correspondent, <laughs> Maria Jimena <Dizan. laughs> No, thanks, but I prefer, yeah, that's, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Mm. Thanks, Frontline, and thanks, uh, Austin, thanks very much, indeed. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>